Hey, Cypher here. Hotel Rwanda is a troubled film. Many of the actual people involved in the story it is based upon have fiercely denounced this movie, while there are many others who have staunchly defended it. So I guess I'm going to weigh into this fight and give a more historical lens for all of this. But I don't really have a side to take, since the evidence has many contradictions. Let's just say I'm ambivalent on this movie's veracity itself. That being said, the reality surrounding the Rwandan genocide as a whole is quite well understood, but it is extremely complicated and involves some of the bloodiest history since World War II. I don't pull punches when it comes to this stuff, so don't be squeamish. It's important to grasp the complicated history that surrounds the Rwandan genocide, and not just the hotel part of this story. We in the West like to pretend like this is some endemic problem of Africa as a whole, rather than strive to understand what the heck happened there. It's a tough, complicated history, but I'll give it my best shot. As an aside, my pronunciation is going to be horrendous today, because there's a bunch of French and Rwandan names, and I was a substitute for a while, so mispronunciation is kind of my thing. So why didn't you say it the first time I said a a -ron? Because it's pronounced Aaron? SON OF A- Rwanda has had a troubled racial climate since even before Europeans swooped in and made things worse. The Tutsis were the ruling elite beforehand, and the lower class were the Hutus, but there was no clear differentiation between the two. The origin of the different statuses is unknown, though a few theories exist. When the Germans took over the territory, and the Belgians after World War I, they cemented the Hutus and the Tutsis as a race. They used ideas of phrenology and other pseudo-scientific things to designate the entire population as either Hutu, Tutsi, or Twa. The Twa are a pygmy tribe of the region and make up only a sliver of the population there. The Hutus are a much larger group population-wise, making up more than 80% of the population today. But the Tutsis continued to hold power under Europeans, even after World War II, where the monarchy tried to solidify power by having independence granted. The Hutus, after having been controlled by the Tutsis for so long, ousted the Tutsi monarchy and violence spread, focusing on Tutsi houses. Hundreds of thousands of Tutsi homes were burnt in the ensuing couple of years of strife. The country became fully independent in 1962 with a Hutu-led government. Over 300,000 Tutsis fled Rwanda after the 1959 revolution, some setting up Tutsi-led regimes in neighboring countries throughout the African Great Lakes region. Tutsis continued to dominate Burundi to the south of Rwanda, even perpetrating their own genocide to maintain control, the worst of which happened in 1972, resulting in the deaths of between 80,000 and 210,000 Hutus. This was reversed in 1993 when a Hutu party was elected, which resulted in between 25,000 and 50,000 Tutsis killed by Hutus who seized on the opportunity for revenge in Burundi. Tutsi refugees were often united in attempts to take back Rwanda coming from Burundi and Uganda, including a massive attempt in 1963. By 1990, the refugees had become well organized. So they made their biggest attempt at retaking Rwanda from the Hutus. A large Tutsi force called the Rwandan Patriotic Front, or RPF for short, invaded from Uganda. After three years of fighting, foreign countries managed to convince both sides to negotiate with each other. In 1993, a transitional government was established that was supposed to give some representation to the Tutsis in a forthcoming coalition government. These accords happened in a neutral Arusha, Tanzania, and were abided by for one meager year. The presidents of Rwanda and Burundi were traveling by plane in April of 1994, when the plane was shot down. No one knows who shot down the plane, but all passengers, including the two presidents, were killed. You have to understand that Juvenal Habyarimana had been president of Rwanda for 21 years. And at such a crucial time in Rwandan history, his presidency was helping to maintain stability in the wake of the Arusha Accords. They are saying President Habyarimana has been murdered. Tutsi rebels have killed him. Nonsense. Why would the rebels kill the president when he agreed to peace? 
The Rwandan Civil War started up immediately right after he was killed, but with a new component. Now the enemy of the Hutu majority wasn't just seen as Tutsi refugees or insurgents, but those who were full citizens. Shooting down the president's plane radicalized the Hutu military establishment. Hutus in distinct positions of power called for the extermination of what they called Inyezi, which means cockroaches, and was originally a term for Tutsi insurgents, but now was being used more broadly to refer to all Tutsis. While the Rwandan army continued the civil war on the frontier, Rwanda as a whole fell into the abyss of genocide. They killed indiscriminately, on a scale never seen before or since in the entire continent of Africa. With mass media broadcasting the explicit call to kill, It is time to clear the brush, good Hutus of Rwanda. We must cut the tall trees. Cut the tall trees now! And the open distribution of machetes, the killing continued unchecked. The United Nations, despite having blue-helmeted troops stationed throughout the country to maintain peace after the Arusha Accords, were powerless to do anything. We're here as peacekeepers, not as peacemakers. My orders are not to intervene. While the genocide erupted, nothing was done to bring the killing to an end. Now, many people campaigned for intervention, but that would mean becoming involved in the Rwandan Civil War as a whole and taking a side. This state of affairs continued until the RPF fought its way through the Rwandan army, who was preoccupied with the genocide. The RPF took over Rwanda on July 15, 1994, instituting rulership by an RPF party that continues to this day. Four months of genocide ended by the insurgents winning the civil war. The killing had taken around 800,000 lives, almost a third of the Rwandan Tutsi population. But that is not where the story of horrific violence ends between the Hutus and the Tutsis. Since the Tutsis were back in control, and many Hutus faced retaliatory violence and international prosecution for war crimes, large amounts of Hutus fled Rwanda into neighboring African Great Lakes countries. Zaire was perhaps the most affected of these, with thousands of refugees in the east. Hutus began launching attacks from there much like the Tutsis had been doing since 1959. Of course, Zaire had been faltering for a while, and the government was on the edge of collapse. Many Tutsi refugees were still in Zaire by 1996, and they were now having to contend with the fighting left over from the Rwandan Civil War. The old Tutsi refugees began rebelling against Zaire of their own accord because of recent restrictions on them and post-genocide Hutu violence. Rwanda, seizing the opportunity for the new RPF party to extend its reach, invaded Zaire. After a year and a half of warfare, the rebels won with the help of Rwanda. Laurent Desir Kabila was put in power in Zaire, and he renamed it back to the old name of the Democratic Republic of the Congo, the name it still maintains. This war took possibly as many lives as the Rwandan genocide, but it gets worse. Kabila severed ties with Rwanda a year later, just as rebellions against the new regime were coming to fruition. Another Tutsi rebellion against the Tutsi Kabila brought Rwanda back to the Congo, and the war commenced again. This time, half of the entirety of Africa took sides. It was an immense war that spread to many other countries. Good chunks of these tried to disassociate Rwanda with the Congo. But the whole thing turned into a quagmire, fracturing into dozens of differing factions. During it, basic foodstuffs and medical aid were denied to entire regions of the Congo as a strategy of various offensives. This war was officially ended in 2003, resulting in between 2.5 and 5.5 and and million deaths. It is one of the deadliest wars in history, and probably the deadliest since World War II. Plus, it really hasn't ended. Rebellion is still an endemic problem in the Congo. So what were the results of the Second Congo War if it was so bloody? Well, as these things often go, hardly anything. The Congo is still in a state of perpetual war, and Rwanda was removed from interfering in the affairs of the Congo. The one thing Rwanda got out of all this was that they managed to negotiate disarmament of forces aligned with the Hutu camps in the Congo, which contained many of those who had committed the Rwandan genocide. 
but it remains to be seen whether that treaty has been fully upheld. The movie focuses on a specific story in this grander narrative. It is about a man named Paul Rusasabagina, who was the manager of the Hotel de Mil Colline in 1984. He kept almost 1,300 people out of harm's way during the genocide, at great personal risk. The movie shows many of the hardships faced by the people who actually lived through this, such as them having to drink pool water. I'm sorry, sir. They shut down the water. This is all we have and the constant threat of genocidaries coming to kill them. It was a harrowing experience for all involved. Rusa Zabagina had to wheel and deal with the genocidaries to maintain the peace, and he was constantly under threat of being killed for helping the Tutsis under his care. Essentially, he'd bribe off the murderers. Luckily, foreign influences tried their best to exert some sort of pressure to protect the hotel's Tutsis, and they had an effect. By the end of the genocide, the only thing the hotel had left was the hope that the UN would eventually swoop in and transport them out of harm's way into a refugee camp. I have nothing left to bribe them with. The UN did try to make a safe convoy, but were held up by genocidary roadblocks. Eventually, the occupants of the hotel were transported to a camp safely, but by local police. It is a small story inside the larger one, perfectly suited to show the overall conflict from a more personable point of view. Since there weren't many records being kept at the time, for obvious reasons. Now please erase the register. Erase it? Yes, I want no names to appear there. There is a lot of leeway for fictionalization here, but the biggest conflict of this narrative is in the scholarship itself. Since the genocide was so all-encompassing, it is difficult to get at the specifics of any person's story. Furthermore, since the event was so terrible, people have a tendency to give conflicting accounts. There is already a disturbing amount of people claiming that there were more Hutus killed than Tutsis as a whole, which is kind of the equivalent of Holocaust denial. So nailing down details is not only bothersome, it is extremely contentious. That's why I told the larger story in the beginning, because the smaller details are all mixed up in this contentiousness. You see, Russo Sabagina is not well liked by the RPF. He has had an open feud with President Kagame, after Kagame assumed power in 2000. And that has politicized this story in such a way that it is difficult to tell the truth. You see, Rusa Sabagina has been somewhat critical of the Tutsi-led RPF. It is high time that Rwandans stand up, yeah. not necessarily to challenge Kagame for the elections of 2017, but to stop what is, has been going on. Yeah. He is quick to point out that they do not represent the majority of Rwanda. That I have decided to combine humanitarian with the political action to liberate the Rwandan people from the Rwandan Patriotic Front dictatorship. Of course, this has led to many people questioning his heroism. Whether you think this man that you say you know deserves this award or does not, and why? He doesn't deserve the award for us as survivors. The mid the hotel in Rwanda was an area which was protected by forces beyond his control. There are now claims that Rissa Zabagina charged Tutsi refugees for food against the Belgian hotel company's explicit faxes telling him not to. I knew poor Rissa Zabagina and he did nothing to save our lives. Instead, he profited from the refugees. Many Tutsis say that he only grudgingly helped them because he was forced by the owners of the hotel. And they claim that he even took a lot of the money for booze and funding the genocide. Milk, beer, and uh, your best whiskey. Interestingly enough, the movie actually shows this as a necessary evil. Good day. Here is your bill for the last week. If you cannot pay or think you will not be able to pay, please go to the banquet room and today will take care of you. Thank you. Where he actually collects all the money he can to make bribes for everyone's safety. But people have claimed otherwise. There are a couple of books written specifically disputing Rusa Sabagina's heroism. President Kagame and the RPF as a whole have even claimed that Rusa Sabagina's current charity work is or has been used to fund Hutu rebels and terrorists. In Rwanda, they claimed you were supporting FDLR. That is a, simply a pure lie. Mm -hmm. 
I never supported any rebel group. Of course, there's a complicating factor to all of this. Rusa Zabagina is no longer living in Rwanda. After a brief stay in a Tanzanian refugee camp after the genocide, he returned to Rwanda in 1996, just as the strife with Zaire was beginning to heat up. Then he was made aware of a series of assassinations that were plotted, with him being one of the potential victims. So he managed to acquire asylum in Belgium, where he remains today. So he's not there to defend himself against any of these claims. Rwanda wants to extradite him, while Belgium refuses. It is a hairy mess. Damn, we're in a tight spot. So with all that being said about the public record, can we even really say what is correct or not here? The filmmakers used what little information they could to try to craft this thing together. If any of the accusations turn out to be true, you can't really blame this movie for being wrong. Most importantly, this movie brought up a lot of the controversy to begin with, since much of it wasn't publicized prior to 2004. You can't blame people for obliviousness, only ignorance. And Hotel Rwanda is certainly not ignorant. It honors the people involved in this. I do have a couple complaints though. Most importantly, it does not engage the reason for the genocide. There is no mention of the Rwandan Civil War, and any violence between the Hutus and the Tutsis is seen as some sort of endemic problem. The Belgians used the Tutsis to run the country. Then when they left, they left the power to the Hutus. And of course the Hutus took a revenge on the elite Tutsis for years of repression. A lot of people, understandably, have trouble trying to understand the reason for genocide, because it's kind of horrible. I mean, just try to find a Holocaust movie that actually explains why the Holocaust was taking place. It's always made to seem like the hatred of the people involved is explanation enough. And that is something that we all deep down want to believe, but that's simply not true. We have to understand why these people became so monstrous, and not simply that they were as such. Furthermore, the end of the movie makes it seem like the end of the violence which is obviously false. If we do not explain the context of the violence, then we make it seem like it's some sort of endemic and unsolvable problem, rather than one rooted in historical precedent. And that kind of ignorance simply allows for more violence to take place. Of course, none of this is explicitly stated in the movie, simply implied by the state of things. There's one other very minor problem I've had with this movie though, and it's not exactly about accuracy. This movie, which is about the genocide of around 800,000 people, is rated PG-13. He's not hurt. This is not his blood. Seriously? Now understand, I'm not complaining saying that this is unsuitable for children or whatever. Far from it. I honestly don't give a rat's ass about the rating system. The problem here is that the movie only shows PG-13 violence. When most of the killings were done by machete, an up close and very bloody act for every single killing, somehow this movie manages not to show a single death by machete. This is history, and if you'll pardon the pun, that edge should never be blunted to appease parents. And that goes for teachers just as much as movie makers. This is a horrifying event that needs to be shown as horrifying. When it does show deaths, it is bloodless and by firearms. Even gunfire is hilariously non-violent sometimes. I mean, look at these guys, just firing into a crowd and not hitting a dang thing. How can you be that bad of a shot? Now this is some PG-13 violence right here. Ooh. Oh no, that escalated quickly. Ugh. So yeah, while the rating is certainly a drawback, it does show some of the devastation. It is a complex movie though, with many subtleties that allow us to see a possible interpretation of Rusus Apagina's heroism in this time of trouble. Does he deserve to be glorified? I don't know, and I don't think there is a definitive answer to be had as of yet. As such, this movie is at least entertaining enough to be worthwhile. Plus, the movie simply being about anything that does not directly involve the Western world is an extreme rarity in Hollywood. There are so many good stories to be told, and whether they are contentious or not, 
This is a case that Hollywood should be proud of itself. Unfortunately, this movie was definitely snubbed at the Oscars. Come on, Hollywood. You had a history film worthy of honoring, and you bypassed it for these movies? Seriously? Well, at least I can recognize this as a worthwhile movie, despite its contentiousness. And hopefully, that is enough.